unorthodox whether i talk or not my presence just says it suggesting everything is evidently seen fucking with the wrong team rolling up the wrong screen leaving the non-believing rhyme for reason most of these derelicts they misreading if you watch those who rock clothes feeling them with your eyes closed who blindfold baby it's like a high zone reaching the climax then rewind again you want to take a ride and then rewind my friend journey in straight down with the sick type i'm worrying burning 10 with the shot i cast when i'm serving them ultra flex in context to leave your mind swept your eyes wet from the sounds bumping i never your ever plan to back down head high rolling through black town be pounding now how that sound i know you cracked by the pound but i track 24 seven days a week i'm writing for fighting the scores never settle don't give a damn what you've embezzled lately i'm a stately individual hate me residuals don't make me i just cash em. copy check subs and then i trash them not a spectacle i'm respectable with fashion a man of few words but many actions used to wear reactions and don't expect to be the main attraction just hit it through my fang contribute to the scene and make the green greener with my nonchalant demeanor if you see what i mean why don't you raise it up a level push up the base of trouble till you're flushing out the devil i'm a rebel without a bullet pull it from the inside like can and then i'll flatten your man Sorry, too early. We'll start in one minute. Welcome everyone. Thanks for being here. Donna said, show up messy, right? Messy, Adana. Unorthodox, whether I talk or not, my presence just says it, suggesting everything is evidently seen. Fucking with the wrong team, rolling up the wrong screen, leaving the non-believing rhyme for reason. Most of these derelicts, they misreading if you watch those with your eyes closed through blindfold baby it's like a high zone reaching the climax then rewind again you want to take a ride and then rewind my friend journey in straight down with the sick type i'm worrying burning 10 with the shot i cast when i'm serving them ultra flex in context to leave your mind swept your eyes wet from the sounds bumping i never ever deck. plan to back down head high rolling through black town be pounding now how that sound i know you cracked by the pound but i track 24 seven days a week i'm writing for fighting the scores never settle don't give a damn what you've embezzled lately i'm a stately individual hate me residuals don't make me i just cash em. copy check subs and then i trash them not a spectacle i'm respectable with fashion a man of few words but many actions used to wear reactions and don't expect to be the main attraction just hit it through my fang contribute to the scene and make the green greener with my nonchalant demeanor if you see what i mean why don't you raise it up a level Good morning. Welcome everyone to our lightning session about this year's issue of DSA conversations across the field of dance studies titled the cyber rock mixtape a virtual hip hop dance listening cipher. Just to let you know we are recording this session so keeping your videos on will serve as your consent to being recorded. Also later in the Q and a portion we do invite you to enter the cipher by turning on your video so we can all share space together. We would like to begin by inviting you to enter this virtual cipher and the chat cipher function, sharing any information you would like, um, such as your name, pronouns, where you rep, what you rep, who, you, who are your peoples, and someone you want to bring into the cipher. My name is Grace Jun. I am here on indigenous Kumeyaay land representing all the people here, I guess. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Thank you for being here. Um, I, I am bringing into this space, bringing into the cipher my way harmony, my my grandma on my maternal side, Chung Hee Lee. Um, yeah, on to you, Mary. Hello, welcome everybody. So excited that y'all are here with us. Um, my name is Mary Park. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I welcome anyone who knows the Anni and Nuna pronouns. I am not yet Ajima. <laughs> uh, I rep New York, even though I am Zooming to you from uh, Chumash land, otherwise known as Thousand Oaks in Southern California. Um, I rep a bunch of 
peoples who are up in here today. Um, I'm on faculty at Cal State Channel Islands. I'm a PhD student at UCLA. Um, I bring my entire family with me into the cipher. Um, both my partner and my kids and my mom are here. So welcome. As we invite you into the cipher, we want to take this moment to acknowledge the passing of Dr. Mama Kariyama Welsh and honor her legacy. We share a testimony of the space she cultivated and the invitations to enter to move by turning to one of our conversants, Savela Grimes. Well, I just want to just give a shout out to some of the people that made me think about what I do with a uh, deeper intention. Um, um, I was actually dating someone in the dance department in Temple and was invited in to, to, to work on a project that Mama Kariyama was doing and it was about Ramona, Africa. And it was the first time I got a chance, at least in the context of Philly, to hear the full story of the MOVE organization, mm. right? MOVE, like the, the, lay, the name of the organization is MOVE. Like, just think about how profound that is to then be invited in to do a piece on Ramona, Africa. And it will start with Ramona and to be invited in to, to just move and do poetry and what have you. Um, and so, bef and this was my first time doing quote unquote concert dance, mm. right? And um, it's, I think it's really important for me to share that Mama Kariyama Welsh is like paramount. Thank you. We begin with gratitude and acknowledging the people that have helped us arrive here. First and foremost to our partners and kids who are here with us in the space, um, to the outgoing editor of DSA Conversations, now VP of Publications, Rosemary Candelario, and the incoming editor of DSA Conversations, Rachel Carrico, and the entire DSA editorial board. We also wanna give a shout out to the Anomalies. Their track, No Illusion, is, that features 427 and Zion I was used with permission by Big Tara, who is also in the space. Thank you for being here. And DJ Cotton Candy, two members of the crew that also includes MC's Invincible, Pre the Honey Dark and Helix. Uh, their track was what we played at the beginning as you entered the space and it can be heard throughout the conversations and was played at the opening of our session. And so to start, um, uh, we're gonna provide some insights into this year's issue of DSA Conversations, how we envisioned it and the process in which we engaged in uh, to produce and edit it. Um, we'll sample a few clips of the conversations themselves throughout the presentation and then have some time at the end for questions and comments. Um, I do wanna shout out some of the conversants who are here with us. We already uh, acknowledge Big Tara, but Buddha Stretch as well. Um, and one of our respondents, Joe Schloss is here. Um, so we could talk about this for hours on end, but we have to keep it incredibly brief. Um, and we invite you to get into the publication itself when it's out. Um, and there you'll be able to read our full intro, our outro, our thoughts behind it. Um, but when Rosemary Condelario reached out to me to submit a proposal for this year's issue of DSA Conversations across the field of dance studies, she let me know that this would be the first time that the publication would be envisioned and executed fully online. So in the past, the publication had taken the format of a PDF um, that would have been printed and then posted up on uh, the web. Um, given my research area of hip hop dance, specifically breaking and oral history methods, she thought that I might have an idea about how a fully online publication might take shape. Um, she was right. I mean, hip hop dancers have consistently been early adopters or late adopters of technology from online bulletin boards to early social media like Zanga and MySpace and YouTube um, to continue networks virtually that they were building at practices and jams. Um, as it was, the pandemic had already forced many dancers to stop gathering in person. Um, and they we, they we took some time to gather online to have difficult conversations and discussions 
that may have only previously um, taken place off the dance floor within our own crews, within our own families. Um, some of the topics that were just in those discussions were history, racism, sexual abuse, trauma. So in conceiving this issue of conversations, we thought we would attempt to document these practitioner theorists in conversation uh, with each other about a specific topic. Then um, Grace and I as guest editors would transcribe and then annotate each conversation. Um, finally, we thought that we would invite an academic scholar to comment or lend their insights to a conversation itself. And so what we did was curate a series of scholarly ciphers um, that centered these hip hop dance practitioners and um, on a secondary level commented on by scholars who write about hip hop culture, hip hop dance and or black dance and culture. So um, the organizing principles of this project were cipher and, the, and ciphering and the idea of a mixtape. Um, and so I'm gonna shout out um, fellow UCLA hip hop studies working group um, to, for introducing me to the work of Shana Redman and Kwame Phillips who co-authored the essay, The People Keep On Going, A Listening Party, Volume One, in the anthology titled The Futures of Black Radicalism, which came out in 2017. So we really wanted to think about what this knowledge production could and should look like. So, um, and particularly at a time when it's so easy to see people dancing on our social media feeds, we can look up any of these really prominent dancer practitioners on YouTube. Um, and I will say that is the one reason that you'll see all the elements of hip hop engaged uh, in this issue, except for you will not see people physically dancing in our issue. If you wanna do that, go on YouTube. Um, and we leave that uh, to you to dig in the crates, so to speak, to use a DJ phrase. Um, along with hip hop methods like digging in the crates, um, uh, show and prove, each one teach one, we engaged in oral history methods and theory. In particular, the practice of deep listening through uh, the processes of interviewing, transcribing, and annotating. Um, and so now we can cite these practitioner theorists in a way that's, now, that's institutionalized. So now we can cite y'all in your own words, not through a, a scholar. Um, and then as I mentioned, we enlisted a um, uh, scholars to write liner notes much in the same way that musicologists provide liner notes for album recordings. Um, okay, so we'll go to the next slide. And then the big question was, who did we wanna cipher with? So um, our conversations as guest editors circled around the questions of who are the people um, whom the dance study scholars might not be familiar with, but should be. A lot of people out there are familiar with members of Rocksteady Crew and folks like Rockefeller and Quickstep. So um, who are some other people whose stories should be heard? Um, another question we asked was what kind of hip hop dance practitioners should be represented? Um, we, there was no way that we could be fully inclusive of all the dances that fall under the umbrella rubric of hip hop dance. So we decided to stick to what some might call like the purest definition of hip hop dance and that's breaking and party dances. Um, and then we also reached out to the people in our network who would be open to participating in this format. So this resulted in contacting people we were already in the cipher of life with um, and people who we hold as fam. Um, and so that ended up looking like this, um, which is our what we call a track list. Um, otherwise known as a table of contents. So you can take a look at um, the topics and also the folks um, who were um, centered in this issue. Um, and we'll hear a little bit of the snippets throughout this presentation, like I mentioned. All right, so next slide. Um, we had, you know, we faced a bunch of challenges. <laughs> We had 12 topics in the original pr proposal, which is a little bonkers. Um, we whittled that down to seven topics um, that we had in the pipeline. And then of course, due to time and scheduling limitations, two fell off the list. And so I just wanna shout out that the two that fell off the list were a conversation between a frat, a frat, a Sherry and Archie Burnett about memory, remembering and club dance, as well as um, a conversation between Candy from New York City um, and B-Girl Rowdy from the UK about sexual harassment and trauma in the breaking scene, a topic that's been 
become really prominent in this past year. Um, we also really wanted to talk about the Olympics, but um, we just really couldn't settle on two people we wanted to talk about it. Fortunately, Mary Yogarty, uh, Mary Yogarty, Mary Fogarty at York University is doing a whole year long speaker series about this exact topic. So I er encourage you to take a look at that. Um, who are the practitioners? Who are the conversants? Um, and what stories do we want to hear about? So a lot of people hear about the Bronx as the birthplace of hip hop. Yes, we're not taking anything away from that. Um, but in these next clips that we're going to listen to, we'll hear about practitioners in other parts of New York. So in this first clip, Big Tara talks about meeting another B-girl, Aruna from the Netherlands, and the hesitancy surrounding that. Um, and then the formation later on of their international B-girl crew called the Heartbreakers. You'll hear from her crew member, Stacey Stash, who's a B-girl of Thai Maori descent who resides in Australia. Here we go. Yeah, I didn't meet y'all until we were at freestyle session. Um, yeah, I think we were at freestyle session. Like, um, this was the freestyle session, like when um, a lot of us were there, like Beta was there, Aruna was there, Honey Rockwell was there. Like, there was just a lot of people at this particular um freestyle session I was out there to perform because Emiko was having uh the juice hip-hop fest yeah. so that's what got me out there um but yeah that's so cool like you and Melo's story sounds like very similar to me and Aruna's story where yeah. like you know um we really bonded like we met in New York but we really also bonded over like Rocksteady anniversary and like all the gems, um, you know, all the stuff that would be like kind of complimentary to it. Um, yeah, like hanging out around the city, like having to like <laughs> leave a message and whatever. Did you and Aruna meet when you're both already in Heartbreakers or in No. Were you connected? Before Heartbreakers even existed, we were cool. Um, yeah, we, yeah, like this was a super long time ago. Um, like we recently celebrated, like like maybe we're like friends twenty five years now, yeah, something yeah. like that. Like I, yeah, um, like we met at a party <laughs> that Invincible <laughs> had invited yeah. me to, because this DJ Jackie was spinning. And I got there and Invincible's like, oh, that's another B girl. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> uh, maybe I should battle her. But then it was <laughs> just know. like it's what it's like, like used to be like, you know, when that was like when I was with, when I was with, I saw Mello up and she invited me to judge. I was like, uh, yeah, I'll come to judge. So, you know, like everyone had this attitude and <laughs> ego. And now it's like it's so much more uplifting. I see like the changes with women in the scene with other women. Yeah. But True. back then you know, it was, you know, yeah, it was like, yeah, I'm just, I'll just battle her, you know. Yeah. I don't know you, like, I don't want to get to know you. <laughs> this is my territory. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. That I remember that instinct, and I remember being glad, like, I always am glad, like, I'm glad I didn't, like, act on that first impulse, and I was just like, oh, calm down, like, let's make friends, and, you know, and, like, that's, like, one of my best friends now, so. You know, yeah, 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 but, um, yeah, yeah. Heartbreakers, heartbreakers. I feel like heartbreakers came after um, Rockefeller created that um, documentary, All the Ladies Say. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like it was a spin off of that because Beta was like, <laughs> I'm doing my own thing, you know, um, yeah. so yeah. All right, so in this next clip, um, you'll hear from my breaking teacher, Break Easy, who speaks with Mighty Mike. They both grew up in the south side of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, battling each other. They're still around and teaching folks um, many, many years later. So here they talk about the formation of their crews in the late 1970s. Where I left off, the collective that we were, when I first started with popping, um, we, we called ourselves because of Thomas and Angel, those were the, the leaders for my collective, was Popping Unlimited. 
you know, but we were a short lived group because all we did was pop, you know, it wasn't until I met the guys in the north side, you know, that um, they had a group called uh, North Side Breakers, because they were already they already was initiating the b-boy movement, because they were into that particular collective. So what happened is like, yo, I kind of liked that dance. And we were just doing one dance, they were just doing one dance, we merged together and we formed breaking in style. And that, 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 uh, that initiated our merger between a popping dance style and a breaking or b-boy dance style to become a, a much better compact collective now, you know? And, that, and we had two leaders, which was Angel Santiago um, from Popping Unlimited and the leader from Northside Breaker was Vincent Andujar, you, you know? And, and Vinny was supposed to be your competitor because Vinny had floats, Mighty Mike. Cause, and back then we didn't know you as Mighty Mike. We only knew you as freaking Miguelito, Miguelito. That's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. during that time, man, it, it, it was uh, insane because when I was growing up in the South Side and I attended these uh, park jams because that's what they were at the time. Yep, um, yep, yeah, there was the park jams. There were just a DJ here with two turntables mixing back and forth. And then he would drop these, you know, the breaks, you know, and I was like, what is this? And then I finally got to see these two guys named Tony and Chaos, you know, these two guys were rocking against each other. And I didn't know what they were doing at the time, but yeah. that caught my interest, man. I was like, yo, what is this, you know? And that started to give me a little groove of like what I, I was feeling, you know? And, um, at the time when I was hanging out with Choco, Choco used to be part of this uh, crew from Coney Island called Furious Rockers, you know? And he was like, yo, let's take a, a trip to Coney Island. And I was reminded, I was like 12 years old, 13, and he was like my guidance, you know? So he was like, come on, I'm gonna take you up there. You're gonna check them out. They're gonna be practicing. We're gonna try to get down. And we started that for a little while, you know? But I noticed that during that time, Joey was the leader of the time. and yeah, Joey Speedy, was right? really Speedy. yes, Speedy. Yeah. He, he yeah, he was a little rocket, tough. Man. He was always tough, you know. He was always like, yeah, yeah, yo, yeah, yeah, man, you got to get that yeah. shit, you know. You got to get that footwork, man. If that ain't right, you know, you can't be down. Like he was always dissing instead of helping, you know, and <laughs> yeah, coaching, you know. We always dissed each other, no matter what. I mean, the, we didn't have no freak, freaking names for movement, you know, back then and uh -huh. stuff. We we just called it like like you said earlier. We just had footwork. We didn't have no four step, six step, three step. I mean, we, we were learning as we battled each other. There was no particular formula to say, well, you have to do this and you have to do that. Cool. I was not on mute that whole time, but all good. Um, so um, when thinking about how we wanted to represent the visual aspect of hip hop culture, I called in my longtime collaborator otherwise known as my life partner, <laughs> hip hop writer slash graffiti artist is one. Um, and so we're gonna move on to the next slide. And one more, there we go. Um, and I'll drop his Instagram in the chat. Um, and so I envisioned that we envisioned a dope cover that was inspired by old school party flyers. I'll show that our inspiration yeah that's the inspiration for it um which then resulted in this fire cover art um so many many props um so um Bayes also created the logo and the branding for this issue of conversations um and we could do this free of charge because he's my partner and he has to and he's involved in the majority of my productions um all right so how can you all interact, get down in the cipher with us. Um, we'll go to the next slide. As you heard, each conversant has their own style of getting down um, in a conversation. So you all, when it's up, have the option to listen to any one of these conversations first. Um, you could read it um, in order as listed in the table of, con uh, table of contents. Um, you could read the liner notes first. Um, how you get down is up to you. And just to underscore the possibilities, we're gonna throw it back to Sabela, um, who brings up the hyperlink as a circular practice. What, what's the hyperlink? What's the hyperlink? 
when you read a blog post and there's hyperlinks, do you read the whole post and then go back to the hyperlink and click it? Or do you read it, there's a hyperlink, you click it, then you go off onto this other, right, web page and you read a little bit and then you come back. Come on, man, stop playing. So the circularity makes sense. So the, the, the in real life, in the digital space, is so similar to how we think about spiritual life, how we think about our material selves all, always being in communion with our immaterial selves, oh my right? Yes. We try to wrap their heads around it. What my earth suit is nothing but an avatar. So when I'm quantum, I'm an avatar. This is nothing but an avatar body. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so methods, how did we envision this issue? Um, we had an initial idea to have the conversants arrange, record and send their own videos. And then we shifted to us organizing, scheduling, recording and actually sit in as a proxy for audience as these conversations happen. We began with the framing that we were interested in based on who the conversants were and their relationship to each other. We gave them grounding questions, but then allowed for the conversations to be led them, led by them really rooted in the oral history methods of, of storytelling and sharing. Um, there were a lot of lessons we learned. We initially I set to have like 45 minutes to an hour for a conversation. Our first conversation between Break Easy and Mighty Mike was almost two hours. And so we really went through the process of how do we edit this? How do we include everything? Because everything is so important um, and that we wanted to share. Also in our first video with them, Miri and I didn't turn our videos off. So in the whole video, we are just sitting there looking, nodding, um, trying to look cute. Uh, and so the editing process of the video uh, dictated was dictated by, by some of the, uh, just the, the factors of us being in the room. So their video looks a little bit different than the following videos. Um, we also had uh, the, the timestamp that Zoom had put on. So how are we gonna cover the timestamp if we are editing the video? And so we had Bayes One bring in a logo that we dropped over the timestamp to take care of that. So le really learning, learning how to go, also trying to figure out as these conversations are happening, how, how did for us to jump back into the cipher, get into the question and we would just, click our video on. And sometimes we would click our video on to say that we're getting back in. And just like in the cipher, uh, sometimes you don't get in. So we would shut our videos and leave and let the conversation happen. Um, lo lots of lessons. One of the things too is, is the care, care that we were trying to take. And it, it aligns with the, the theme of the conference of building an anti-racist praxis, transformative connections and movements of rad radical care. Um, we were really thinking about accommodations for time, uh, making sure our conversants were available, um, uh, our dis editorial decisions. We took cues from oral history methodology and making sure that we were uh, really thinking about all those involved. We circled back to double check with folks to make sure what was recorded or um, annotated was okay to be shared. Um, and then we heard from one of our conversants that they didn't want to be seen. So we took the time to blur out their video. And this is an example of their conversation. I am putting a content warning um, that there's a talk of self-harm and suicide. Please take care for yourself if it's needed. The video is about three and a half minutes long. Um, and in this clip, they talk about perceptions of the culture narrative and what the culture did for them and really also the care that they had for each other and others that they were bringing up in the culture. We, uh, we have this narrative uh, that is portrayed in hip hop that like um, we came from gangs and then we created hip hop. So, and then after we created hip hop, we eliminated gangs, everything with peace, love and having fun. And it's, it's, like the first thing from the truth, I think is it, it's that a bit us in the ass. Yeah. It, 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 and, and it, it, it haunts us. Right. Because like, you know, I, I feel like uh, you know, when you, when you hear from like the academic standpoint or from the, um, the layman standpoint, right. The civilian standpoint, that's what 
they they either go by that narrative because it makes them feel safe and it makes them feel better about like you know uh, hiring practitioners or or using hip hop, but they're really scared of it. And the the their that fear is the reality of where we come from and what powers this culture. There's a lot of toxic shit that people are dealing with, you know that that they and they're using hip hop to get through it, and that's their right. Um, but then we don't know how to like go further than that, you know. Like I. I was suicidal, you know, I was depressed as a child and I was suicidal, you know, um, I, I would go out and put my life in danger intentionally. On purpose, I bet, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. I wouldn't turn on a fight, I'm a, I'm, I'm a run, I was always the smartest dude, I was raised by people in my community that were like, throw the first punch, don't back down from a fight, you know, and if they hurt otherwise, you get back to the block and that's your ass, you're in trouble. So, you know, I, I got into a lot of shit, you know, a lot of like unnecessary shit in, in during my time where had there been like older brothers telling me like nah there's another way like don't get me wrong I'm I'm grateful for those lessons and those experiences because I'm able to pass them yeah on but you were one experience myself. going wrong from not being who you are today and absolutely. being able to do what you do today you know absolutely, absolutely. so that's I, how I, that's that's what's at stake <laughs> yeah like, I, I i grabbed onto this culture and i said like you know this is don't i feel like at the moment it was only thing keeping me alive but then like you know the ego is still out there and i'm like you know in train tunnels and hanging off of bridges and ledges and roofs and doing all types of things where and putting myself in the in, in neighborhoods that shouldn't be in in positions that shouldn't be in where um I knew what the outcome was and I didn't mind. I didn't care. Um, and so I had to do a lot of like, you know, searching and self-discovery and, 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 and constant reevaluation of who I am and what I want to do in my communities and what I want to be a part of in order for me to realize I have to leave some of that behind. And it's com- these are conversations that are not happening in our communities. You know, we tell people, hey, I use hip hop as we, an outlet. We, we, need, we need people to see that deeply personally role model by people is kind of like yo i'm not trying to front on anything this is the this is the, this is the real deal story because that'll give help hopefully give other just like someone talking about sexual abuse mm-hmm. here's somebody else come out and talk about sexual abuse and then all of a sudden 10 more people for whoever that person was would come out and stuff because hip-hop can be about a collective power but it's also could be about collective courage you know, which is, uh, we're not meant to do it alone. We need each other on that, but it needs yeah. to be honest and it needs to be willing to be vulnerable. And that seems like a polarization in, in the mean streets. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you, you uh, how the fuck you, can you be vulnerable? You know? Our next clip is a conversation between Buddha Stretch and Ms. V and uh, addressing what folks were understanding or not understanding what hip hop is. And in this clip, Stretch is uh, talking about teaching for a competitive team in Trinidad, competing in the hip hop dance competition circuit. Eventually they're they're going, something is going to be the catalyst to show them, well, um, this, thing that you calling hip hop isn't actually hip hop. And that's what that for me, that's what actually happened. I just had to sit back and wait and watch and have faith. And for me, it was really strange at first because I remember uh, like Monsell and, and Terry and Brian, Brian Green, they were all adamant, like, now nah, we're going to this place and we're going to, you know, we're going to scream on, we're going to let them know. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going. Go ahead. And they were adamant in the 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 criti- you know, they were criticizing how it was run, but I'm like, you can critique it, but you can only critique it so far. They can't do what they don't know. Yeah. You know, they can only go as far as they don't. Eventually they'll have to know. And if you have patience, it'll pay off. For yeah. me, it was totally different in that. I didn't take part in any of the competitions, but I still took part in it in that I got called uh, by a group from Trinidad who uh, they had been in the competition for years and could never get past second place, third and second place. They kept 
you know, coming up short and they kept wondering why. And so someone told someone else that they needed to get these guys in touch with me, that I had the information to show them what they needed to go on in order to win. And so in my discussion with them, I was like, okay, you know, what do you want me to do? And it was like, well, you know, we need to learn what some of these styles are. Like they didn't know what popping was. They didn't know what house was. They didn't know what hip hop was. They thought they did, but they didn't. Right. And so, you know, they flew me out to, to uh, Trinidad and I worked with these guys for like a week or so. And I literally had to teach them go through each style. Wow. You know, we spent one, we spent the first day, like two hours, just, I was just teaching them how to lock, <laughs> the basics in locking. Wow. And they're like, whoa. And then I'm teaching them how to pop, you know, and, and the, just the technique. And I'm like, man, we don't, you know, they put these things in the rules, but we don't know what these things are. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's because they don't know what these things are either. They're just throwing them in there. <laughs> So just to wrap up, like I said, we can chat forever. Yeah, bars for real. Um, we can chat forever. I put in the chat, we have an after party Zoom set up because after the party, it's the after party. Uh, so feel free to uh, copy that so that we can all jump into that cipher. Um, we have some hopes for future engagement. Um, if you know folks want to engage in this format for you know, future issues of DSA conversations, um, our thought was that, um, the guest editors could invite a slate of scholars um, who would then, each scholar would be responsible for a conversation. Um, so this particular one, we, Grace and I split that labor um, and it was a lot of time. Um, on the flip side of this suggestion um, is that had we followed this format of sort of like parsing out the, the labor to other scholars is that we likely wouldn't have asked senior scholars or people established um, in hip hop studies um, to make the time for this process. Part of the reasons why we could get the dope ass respondents of, and I'm gonna name them all here, Nadine George Graves, Imani Kai Johnson, who's here, Joe Schloss, who's here, Saruj Aprahamian, and Jesse Mills, who's also here to cipher with us because there was a low time commitment. Um, and uh, so those are the things that we'd have to, uh, you'd have to balance. Um, in retrospect, um, we were not thinking of the exact phrasing of anti-racist praxis, transformative connections of radical care, but we do think that this method is one way to enact these ideas. Um, and so we think, that we believe it vibes and resonates with from what um, we've witnessed as being discussed regarding dance scholarship and pedagogy in this co conference so far. Um, but mostly we hope that this method inspires you um, and is generative to your own research. And we just want again to express our love and gratitude to all our conversants and respondents, particularly our partners who had no choice but to participate in this cycle with us. <laughs> Thank you, Bayes and Jesse, for being here and all of you who have supported us through this and our conversants who are here, thank you for showing up today. Um, we have now time for questions and comments. Uh, we, oops, we invite yeah. you to, the, uh, to turn your videos on, ask questions in the chat, raise your hand, um, cipher with us. We've got, we, we did it. We have, we planned for 20 minutes of Q and A. And we have 19 minutes, so um, we can either do the stack thing in the chat, or you can raise your hand, or we'll we'll we'll, we'll figure it out as we go along. But thank you, I'm Buddha Stretch. I see you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Um, I'm going to unpin us so people. Yeah, unpin us. Oh, break easy's up in here too. Papa Rich. <laughs> you have to play catch up. Yeah. Um, Any questions, comments? 
any of the conversants or respondents want to talk about your experience? Learn about it. <laughs> yes, good morning. This is Richard. Can, can you hear me? Yep, we hear you, Papa Rich. Let's break Perfect. easy. You know, um, I'm, I'm very honored to be among other peers expressing their thoughts on this. Um, I'm very ecstatic concerning the, the collective here that we are sharing our stories based from our experiences and trying to catch the emotional aspect and the way our time, our mentality and thoughts were um, being misrepresented by others who are not participants within the movement, you know? if you want to call it a movement. I just figured that it's a part of who we are. It's a part of our life. So it's our life uh, movements that is constantly changing, you know? Um, I'm still trying to absorb everything from the from people that are around me that I wasn't aware. And to me, that's, I, I cannot measure that because it's, it, it's a humbling experience to know that at that time frame, I wasn't um, aware that others were doing the exact same thing. Because when we're young, we don't seem to realize that. We know what we're doing, but we don't realize the full aspect of the of full aspect. You know? And now I had a conversation a while ago with, um, I think it was Joe Schloss at one time when it was like, oh, where do we go now? You know, we're older. You know, I've always, I've always stated that hip hop is for the young generations, the, the, the shakers in a way. So how do we continue our contribution by sharing our experiences uh, of going back and reanalyzing what was my state of mind when I was younger to what was my, my, my social environment when I was younger? What was the environment when we were younger? Because it's not the same now. You know, and, and at the same time is that we're learning how to empower ourselves because of those experiences and sharing it with people. That's the new direction for us elderly people who are in the hip hop culture. You know, and I'm like say I'm trying to absorb as much as possible from what our thoughts are combined. Oh my God, it's so empowering. It just lifts, lifts me up. You know, and and I try to pass that on to all my uh, my my partners, you know, or anyone that I come across, both in the hip hop culture and outside the hip hop culture. People think that the hip hop culture is so boxed in, and this is what it is, and people don't realize that it's 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 symbiotic. It's both. It's me. It's you. It's them. It's we. It's the good, the bad, the everything. You know. And hearing the panel, I just enjoy that. Thank you. Thanks, Papa Rich. Thank you, um, Joe. What's up? Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, so just a couple. I wanted to respond to a couple things uh, that Break Easy was saying. Um, and first of all, this is wonderful, and I just really appreciate uh, and am honored that you you invited me to participate in it, and I'm so inspired by everything that everybody's doing. Um, First of all, I learned a lot of what I know about this art form from Break Easy specifically. Um, and I think it's important to say that not just in terms of uh, facts or moves, um, he taught me basically my foundation, um, and but also way, ways to think about it. Um, and I was, uh, uh, one of the things I was thinking about with one of those clips where, where they were talking about the hyperlinks is in um, Imani and Mary's uh, uh, anthology I wrote a piece for. It. And one of the things I did was use the 6F as a, as a metaphor, um, basically in the same way. That in other words, the 6 step is a move, but each step in the 6 step is a potential transition to other, to other moves. And you can, take those, you can take those transitions or not. And that's something that I learned from Rich. So, um, I, I wanted to give credit for that and, and thank him for, for, for really um, uh, encouraging me to, to, to think about these ideas and, and, and see what I can do with them. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say is in terms of my own work, um, a lot of, uh, in terms of your question, Mary, um, I feel like a lot of, of what I have been trying to do in, in, in everything I do is, is unlearn and critique a lot of the 
bullshit academic assumptions that we make about things. And particularly this idea that um, if you draw ideas and concepts from the communities that you work in, then you're not an original thinker as an academic, that as an academic, you're supposed to come up with your own ideas. And that means by definition, rejecting the perspective of the people that you're working with. Um, and I always thought that was bullshit. And I always said that, that and I'm on record of, of saying that for 25 years. However, I do feel like, and I'm very excited about this, we're getting to a point where we have unlearned a lot of that. <laughs> and now the time is to continue to move forward from there. And, and, and so instead of we're moving, I think a lot of my work was like rejecting a lot of a lot, a lot of these fucked up assumptions. Um, but now that a lot of those assumptions have been rejected, now it's time to, to move forward and, 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 and create new um, uh, foundations for, for thinking about this stuff. And I'm really excited that you guys are doing that. So I just wanted to, uh, to thank you for that. Thank you so much. Um, for those of you all don't know, Joe has an ethnography about the New York City breaking scene and I dropped the link to Evil Corp, <laughs> this book on Evil Corp in the chat. Um, yeah, there's stuff happening in the chat as well. Uh, I just wanna say that Tara is saying as more and more institutions work on diversifying their rather white curriculums, how do those of us who are qualified to actually bear and share the culture accurately acquire those teaching positions? Um, and she said that she's seen a lot of unqualified or underqualified people tasked with these positions, which is really disturbing to her as someone living in New York City. And so I will say that Tara and I, when before we had the official conversation, often talked about this, or we, we had a number of conversations about this, and that we do hope, and to address Adana, your question of like, how um, do we conceive of this as being anti-racist praxis, radical care, transformative, um, um, transformative, blah, blah, <laughs> um, relationships, um, that, you know, if those of us who are ready have positions within the academy, even though our positions are contingent, we are not tenure track faculty, um, you know, we, we have like half our ass in the door. So like, how do we transform um, the, the system that we reside in that actually have actively rejected all of this um, throughout its ten, you know, its its institutional history um, from the inside out, and so part of conceiving conversations that was really important to us was that people could cite this as a publication that now people can put Big Tara and Break Easy and Buddha Stretch um, on their you know, as part of their bibliographies, as their work cited, that they're not being quoted through a scholar, through an intermediary scholar, but right in their own words. And so that that is a scholarly publication that lends to if, you know, institution is looking at their CV that, oh, this person is a scholarly, you know, they, they drop into that scholarly cipher, right? So um, I want to hand the floor over to Jaslyn. But before Jocelyn, before you go, hi, thanks for being here. I just wanted to add too that we we really started with our, just reminding you, we started with these questions that we wanted to ask that we were interested in, but really allowing for the conversation to go where the conversants took it, what they were interested in communicating and sharing. Um, and some hadn't seen each other in a long time, partly because of the pandemic. So being a, a catch up conversation, but uh, go ahead, Jocelyn. Yeah, I just wanted to say like, thank you for all of this. Cause I don't know, it's just divine intervention as like a budding uh, scholar in the space, and especially one who is of a different region of black social dance and hip hop. And cause I'm from the Midwest, Milwaukee represent, we are ever, if not the Midwest is ever in conversation. And now we're starting to see more of the techniques coming within the academic sphere, but also, it floods back and forth, even in the commercial dance space as well. Um, I, I, I had a question about uh, when, what what was the methodology methodology that you used to kind of like culminate um, and write out a lot of the oral histories? Because for me, I feel like that's where I need to like go into since a lot of the culture of hip hop from, especially from Milwaukee literally lives digitally and within the people it's like literally not written down anywhere so I feel like that will help me but then also to to go off of what we just came from uh 
that whole like I I and my friends of early academics always have these conversations of like who is qualified and underqualified to be in this space like what is the process of somebody who do desire a tenure track position who may not have the degrees but got like all of the life and and a mama and plus experience to be in these spaces um, and then even towards one another, like how are we uplifting the practices of still being engaged with community? I can say for myself, like I'm not from Boston, but I make sure that within my curriculum and within a budget that I invite the Boston hip hop practitioners and historians within my space, because not only is it important to have a land acknowledgement of the indigenous people, but also of the culture of hip hop within this region while also sharing where I come from. But even then it's like pulling tooth and nails because institutions are like, who are they? <laughs> Why do we need to have them here? Because of what yeah. the hierarchy says or even like who gets to get hired or even those who are like, I want to teach here but I don't want to be tenure track. I just want to have the opportunity to share my stuff with the students. So yeah, it's yeah. a big circle. Like There's a there's a couple of things. I mean, we, you know, in a separate session, DSA session, you know, Jazz and a bunch of other folks and I talked about, you know, the challenges of bringing popular dance forms into the academy because the academy, dance in the academy started specifically with modern dance and ballet, which are Eurocentric forms. And that has shaped almost every single depart dance department across the United States and beyond. Right, like there are, are dance departments in universities around the world that also center these Eurocentric dance forms, um, and so what? What you know, a couple of things that we mentioned in that group was that you know folks like us do need to take on the responsibility because, as an Asian American woman, people are not threatened by my presence, and I have to acknowledge that, and um, that I have to use the things that you know that I the power that I can claim to fuck it up from the inside out, right? So like to go into upper administration, to you know understand how budgets work, how the bureaucracy works, because really half the battle, the actual battle of, of you know, folks being in the academy is understanding how to navigate this system. And all, that's really, really what it comes down to. So there's the other ideas of how do we fast track practitioners, um, to get the degrees, but the education is not about, you know, making sure that you know how to dance because everyone who would go through the program are leaders in their field, right? Uh, they're master teachers who are flown around the world to teach these particular dance forms. But the education part is actually, here's what's being expected of you, right? A syllabus, here's what's being expected of you to, you know, adhere to university standards, blah, blah. But that's not gonna take that long. So that's how we can fast track that, right? Um, the other part of the oral history aspect is that my MA was at Columbia in the um, as an American Studies MA student, but really my advisor is Mary Marshall Clark, who is the director of the oral history, uh, the Center for Columbia Center for Oral History there. Um, and so that methodology is really about deep listening on multiple levels. So, so you, as in the interview technique, are not doing the qualitative interview question answer question answer you start with a prompt and you let people speak. And that is someone recalling their life story without your intervention, without your prerogatives getting in the way. Because what you're trying to do in recording this is understand how they're recalling their life experiences. Um, and so there's a lot, of, um, a lot of stuff written about that. And I kind of latched onto it when I, the first time I was in grad school because I was like, that vibes with you know, all the stuff that we talk about within the scene, which is like, learn your history. Who are the people that came before you? Listen to their stories, you know? Um, I also have um, a chapter that I'm supposed to be editing for Rosemary as well, um, for dance research methodologies that also includes oral history specifically for dance and why. Um, so that will be coming out, but I also do have a chapter regarding this in the forthcoming Oxford Handbook on Hip Hop Dance Studies, which Imani Kai Johnson is a co-editor and a number of us have made contributions to, which will be out shortly. Um, I think, Grace, did you wanna add something? Yeah, I just just to your piece, Jaslyn, about how, how, how we incorporate, you know, um, I was told early on that I don't do real hip hop from someone who has nothing 
has no knowledge of what hip hop is, right? So I was like, who are you to tell me what hip hop is when you, you don't practice the form, right? But then I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like in the room here with Buddha Stretch and Break Easy. And I'm like, oh my God, do I do real hip hop? Like I'm checking myself, right? So I really think about the ways that I make sure I bring in practitioners to guest teach in my class, to, to make sure the students know about them. I, I lecture about them. I pay them out of my own pocket to make sure they come and teach because there's no institutional support and because that's what I believe in, right? And as an Asian American woman who grew up in this black cultural art form, it, it's so imperative for me to talk about appropriation. And I'm sure everybody is so tired of me talking about appropriation, but thank God for Amani's uh, article. Like I make my students read it and we have a conversation. What does it mean to be a non-black person um, teaching, engaging, performing these, um, these forms? And, and a lot of them, I try, I try to really push them in the sense of like, uh, what they think hip hop is. Are you putting on, you putting on the markers of hip hop that at the end of the day, because I teach mostly Asian American students, that at the end of the day, they can take off. And so I really call them out and say like, you are doing a metaphorical black facing right now. And so it's really important to learn um, the history, the roots, the context, to hear the stories um, from the people that were there, the people that are practicing even though I feel like my knowledge has grown, um, sitting in that conversation with Break Easy and Mighty Mike, I was like, oh my God, I know so little, so, so little. So these stories are so important to hear um, and share. And we have one minute left before we have to click. We invite you, like Miri said, we are Virgos. We are extra, extra, extra. So we have an after party for you to join for us to converse more um, if you'd like to join us there. So, and thank you to Rachel who's popped in our, our editor for conversations for helping us. So. Thank y'all, thank y'all. Oh yeah, Emery's a Virgo, hell yeah. <laughs> yes, thanks Ellen. Thanks babe. Thank you Mara. Thanks Jesse. Pat Cohen, I miss you. Come join us. We'd love to talk more. Hi, Mary. It's good to see you. Yay. Thank you all for joining us. Have fun at the luncheon if you were there at Rutgers. <laughs> we'll see you all up in the other Zoom. We're going to bounce. Bye.